All right, for our second talk of the morning session of day two of giving and asking for reasons, we have one of our locals, Ladislaw Koren, and um, I'm not gonna say anything more. Take it away. Can you hear me? No? Should I hold the microphone? Okay, thank you very much. So in my talk, so, okay, in my talk, now it's okay. Uh, okay, in my talk, I shall scrutinize evolutionary theories of reasoning that subscribe to the following three claims. First, they claim that if you are to understand characteristic features, successes and failures of human reasoning, we should look at it as a natural trait that was once selected for because it served some adaptive function. The target phenomenon to be understood is delimited as kind of deliberate thinking of the following sort. One consciously takes account of evidence or reasons of sorts for or against holding something true, and one unjust or change one's view accordingly. And of course, this may take the form of either private reasoning or public exchange of reason. Second, the theories claim that reasoning is most likely to be adaptive in its public form. Some claim that it evolved to promote vital social ends and indirectly also vital epistemic ends, for instance, Mercier and Sperber, or Norman. Others claim that it evolved to promote vital epistemic ends and indirectly also vital social ends. For instance, Smith at Walt claim this position. Third, all theories claim that my side bias is a design feature of public reasoning, which promotes its proper functioning or facilitates an efficient division of reasoning labor that helps groups under certain conditions to achieve normatively good outcomes. And my side bias is roughly defined as a tendency to look for evidence or reasons for one's favorite view and not to look for or ignore evidence or reasons against it. So to keep my discussion reasonably short and focused, I shall only argue that the case made for the claim three is moot. So this is my goal in the lecture. I shall argue that the claim three of these evolutionary theories is kind of suspect, but not well justified. And I also will make at the end of the lecture some tentative suggestions and conclusions how to do better. So let me start with the first and best developed evolutionary theory in this spirit, which is the theory proposed by Mercier and Sperber. So Mercier and Sperber sharply contrast their theory with, with the position they call classical intellectualism. The classical intellectualism claims that reasoning is unlikely to have evolved in its private form and for the function, for the classical epistemic or rational function of updating our beliefs about the world in the direction of knowledge or better beliefs or true beliefs. Mercier and Sperger, Sperber argue that if that is the adaptive function of reasoning, then we would expect human reasoning to perform that function often enough and well enough. But the embarrassing problem for, for classical intellectualism is that most of the time we do well enough without reasoning. Our pre-reflective information processing machinery is often up to the task. It is efficient and reliable. True, the machinery sometimes misfires, but then reasoning all too often fails to correct it and rather tends to advocate and reinforce the mistaken intuitive beliefs produ produced by the machinery. So they propose an alternative theory, which they call argumentative theory reasoning or recently interactionist theory of reasoning. And the gist of the theory is that reasoning primarily evolved in its public form of reasoned exchanges 
and for a kind of social communicative function. And the main function they propose is to argue, to persuade others, and to evaluate such arguments so as to be persuaded only by good arguments. So that's the proposal. And now when we unpack this theory, it goes as follows. The claim is that argumentation could have sustained and facilitated mutually beneficial communication. Reasoning evolved via natural selection in its public form and primarily for the social function to devise and evaluate arguments intended to persuade. Uh, to pass, the idea is that to pass messages, uh, sorry, uh, the idea is that hearers needed some assurance that they won't be deceived or misled, misled by speakers being suspicious either of speaker's credibility or of the content of their messages, if it didn't fit with hearers' beliefs. So to pass messages, to successfully pass messages through this bottleneck of epistemic vigilance, speakers started to give favoring considerations, arguments, which are more likely to be accepted, accepted by hearers than the messages they want to sell. As speakers benefited primarily from making others to agree with them for whatever strategy, strategic purposes, they primarily needed to build a favorable, persuasive case for their favorite position of view, not one that objectively supports it as likely to be true. At the same time, however, hearers or interlocutors should have been demanding and objective enough in processing arguments intended to persuade them for they benefited from being converted to speakers' views only if that view, if that view was likely to be true. So they cared whether it was well supported. They thus tended to test views and arguments, looking also for arguments for the other side of the issue at hand and assessing what there is most reason to believe or accept. And this in turn pressed proponents or arguers to elaborate better or good enough arguments to persuade such demanding and objective interlocutors. And as a welcome epistemic byproduct, good enough reason passing this bottleneck tended to approximate it also epistemically good reason. So the epistemic goods are sort of welcome byproducts of this project according to this theory. So an important part of this theory is a kind of theory of efficient division of cognitive or argumentative labor. So the claim is that an efficient strategy for arguers to adopt is to divide the cognitive load and work, building a favorable case for their position whilst leaving into address interlocutors to come up with challenges or requests for additional consideration that would better support arguers' case. For if interlocutors are satisfied, why should arguers expend more efforts than needed by elaborating a more even-handed case? Plus, it may be difficult to know interlocutors' beliefs, so to know whether interlocutors would find advertised reason consistent with their beliefs, and so on. So only if interlocutors press arguers, uh, do the arguers need to respond by, uh, to respond by undermining objections or building a more elaborate case for their favorite position. So that's the idea that there is some kind of efficient division of cognitive labor, which makes sense according to this theory. So there is some evidence or reason supporting this the theory as Mercier Spember claim. So the, perhaps the most important evidence on which the, on this claim I will focus in particular is that Whereas my side bias embarrasses classical intellectualism, it is nicely explained by this theory. Because if one is to persuade others to adopt one view, one naturally searches for and produces evidence or reasons for one's view or against conflicting views. So my side bias is supposed to be an adaptive design feature and not a bug of reasoning, promoting its main function of producing arguments intended to persuade others to accept one's own view. Uh, the other evidence which is claimed for this theory 
is that it also seems that reasoning, human reasoning, actually performs the postulated function, argumentative function, often enough and well enough, which is important if it is supposed to be kind of adaptive ability. So the claim is that argumentation and evaluation thereof is and can be hypothesized to have been frequent and important enough social communicative activity at which people, people tend to be reasonably good, unlike at private reasoning. So for instance, people seem, there is some evidence that people more easily and efficiently, efficiently produce arguments for their own views and, and against the views of others against different or conflicting views of others. There is also some evidence that people more objectively evaluate others' arguments than their own. So that's a kind of important prediction of this theory and there is some evidence which supports this prediction. And also there is some evidence that people tend to be persuaded by better or stronger arguments, which is on the side of interlocutor, uh, interlocutors who are supposed to be demanding and objective. So these are the kind of evidence. And importantly, also the theory predicts and explains better outcomes, normatively better outcomes, according to some kind of rational uh, standards, normatively better outcomes of group deliberation in the reasoning task, for instance, based on selection task, even outperforming individual participants with best ideas in the groups. So this is the kind of evidence or support for the theory and now, as we are supposed to be demanding and objective interlocutor, interlocutors, we, should, we shouldn't be easily persuaded by this theory, I suppose. So let us assess the merits of this theory, in particular the claim three, that my side bias is kind of adaptive, functional design feature of public reasoning with a kind of proper function, which Mercer and Sperber postulate the argumentative like function. So now, uh, I have some objections, maybe they are not powerful, maybe they are, you are supposed to evaluate that, but my first uh, objection goes as follows. Uh, at some points, Mercier and Sperber, especially in their evolutionary just so story, stress the threat of being deceived, uh, sorry, being deceived by speakers. That's supposed to be kind of pressure, which in turn, uh, triggers some kind of response and the sense of epistemic vigilance and the epistemic vigilance in turn presses arguers to argue their cases. So that's kind of important in the theory officially. But it seems to me that this can't be the right kind of scenario, evolutionary scenario in which my side bias promotes the function of persuading others. Because arguer, malicious arguer who wants to deceive the, the hearer wants here to adapt a view that arguer actually doesn't hold true. But the problem is that my side bias, as it is defined, including by Mercier's paper, is supposed to help arguers persuade hearers to adapt arguer's own actually held views or beliefs, not the views or beliefs they do not have. In addition, in manipulative or deceiving purposes, Arguers should actually be good at searching for finding reason arguments for views decoupled from their own. But the problem is that the theory says that we should have troubles to find or search for arguments or reasons or evidence for the views that are different from our own. But of course, the manipulative arguer is supposed to argue for a view which he doesn't, be, she or she doesn't actually hold. So this is a kind of prima facie first objection against the view. Now, there is a reply to this objection, which made some sense. Perhaps Mercier's and Sperber view can be made consistent with stressing, or mostly stressing, cooperative context or argumentations, that is, argumentations on issues that actually matter to mutually beneficial cooperation. That is, for instance, the argument of Smith and Wald. Because this objection, the first objection, was raised in some form even before, for instance, by Norman, and by Tomasello, who argued that, okay, the theory is kind of good, but it implausibly stresses manipulative context, competitive context. So the response is that the theory needn't stress manipulative context. In such context, 
So the reply goes, people actually had common interest to figure out the true or good solution together, to share relevant information beating on the issue, to assess it in the light of evidence and reason, and eventually to figure out the right or correct solution. So if that is the case, if we so adjust the theory and we de-emphasize competitive context and the threat of being misled or being deceived, there is no need to overcome mistrust on the part of the heroes because in cooperative context, the trust is not the issue. If we are all stand to benefit from mutually beneficial cooperation, then there is no reason to deceive or it's diminished. So no motive to deceive. Okay, so let us suppose that this is indeed Mercier's and Sperber considered view, but then I argue they face another objection. The objection is that in cooperative context, people benefited or benefit from making, from making others to agree with them only if their own views were more likely to be true in light of evidence or reasons. Because the idea is and the motive is to figure out correct solution together. Everybody has an interest to find correct solution, bearing on the co cooperation. So if others' views prove to be better in that epistemic respect, then people actually benefited from revising their views, not imposing their views on the others. So I conclude that if Merciers and Sperber want to stress such cooperative context, as they are advised to by Smith and Wald, Tomasello, Malcolm, uh, Norman and all, then they cannot also claim, as they do, that arguers are not after the truth, but after arguments supporting their views, true or false. And that this explains the notorious confirmation bias. Then they changed the name to my side bias. This is the original paper in which they, in which they propounded the position. So my conclusion is of this objection too, that if arguers have such a common interest to find correct solutions, then reasoning does have epistemic rational function after all, even in its productive uses. Because the idea is that it already has some kind of epistemic function in its evaluative uses because interlocutors, hearers are supposed to be epistemically vigilant. They are supposed to care about truth of the messages and about the godness of arguments. But the theory says that arguers, producers of arguments are not so interested. They do not care in the first instance about the truth, about the reasonable case to be made. So my conclusion is this, if we stress cooperative context and if we stress the common interest to find the truth, that it cannot be the case that arguers do not have epistemic ends. And we can't, can't claim that the function of reasoning, the argumentative function of reasoning is a purely social, purely to persuade others. So that's the second objection. Now I have the third objection uh, that on Mercy's and Sperber theory, people should be actually lean at or comparatively lean and bad at probing their own views. That's part of the explanation of my side bias, but comparatively active and good at probing the views of others who might disagree with them. That's after all supposed to be the case which triggers argumentation in the first place, the disagreement according to the theory. So assuming now a strong impact of my side bias on both sides of the dispute, why should I or the other party change position rather than each party sticking to her guns conceivably even in a more polarized manner? There is the problem, the threat of polemical deadlock. If we emphasize my side bias, if it's too strong for both sides of the dispute and both sides, sides of the dispute, both parties to the disputes are supposed to have some extra greed, some pre-existent view because this agreement presupposes some, some clash of views. So now I just follow to the consequences the assumption that both parties to the dispute are strongly affected by my side bias. Then it can result in some kind of polemical deadlock. One party supports her pre existent view with favorable reasons. The other party, biased about her own pre existent view, challenges or objects to them. 
The first party in turn responds by objecting to such, to such consideration or by giving a new argument in favor of our position and so on. And the, the question is, what prevents them from ending up with some kind of polemical deadlock, which is fueled by, my side, by strong mindset bias? So the conclusion is that strong mindset bias would actually prevent reaching agreement, which is likely to be true. But there is a reply to this re objection, which they explicitly anticipate, probably, and want to preempt. So the idea is that when people process reasons provided by others, that's the supposed evaluative function of reasoning, they not only tend to probe them, but are ready to be convinced upon finding them good enough. So Mercier says, when we evaluate, it, uh, evaluate arg others' arguments, the main task of reasoning, of reasoning is to recognize good arguments and to make us change our mind accordingly so that we end up with better beliefs on average. A strong mindset bias in evaluation would make argumentation pointless. So the idea is that when we evaluate arguments, when we receive and evaluate arguments, we actually are kind of objective, critical but objective, and eventually we can be convinced by good arguments. So the theory goes, so the reply goes. Okay, uh, now follow above is my objection fourth. The situation to me seems to be more complex and likely less asymmetrical. So the common definition of my side, unlike the definition of Mercier, is goes like this the tendency for people to evaluate evidence generate evidence and test hypotheses in a manner biased toward their own opinion which is for instance the definition used by stanovich West and in many other papers but there is also evidence that people tend to be biased also in interpreting and evaluating evidence or arguments as better or worse so oh, I have some references if somebody is interested, but there is some work done, some studies, experiments, which seems to show that people under some circumstances tend to be also biased in interpreting an evidence uh, and evaluating evidence or arguments. So it's not only like people uh, tend to be biased in producing arguments, but there is also some evidence that people tend to be biased also in assessing evidence. The question is, of course, under what circumstances and how often and how strong the bias is and how it can be eventually overcome. So moreover, the two processing modes are supposed to be the, on the one hand, search for reasons, search for arguments, and on the other hand, evaluation of arguments, according to me at least, are far from dissociated or separated. Often in evaluating arguments, we search for rebuttals, defeaters, or counter arguments. Also, this is also kind of shown by the previous, previously quoted, quoted studies. So if that is the case, we have a kind of more symmetrical situation. Maybe the my side bias is stronger when we produce reasons. I do not deny that, but there is also some kind of thread of my side bias or bias the reason in evaluating arguments. It seems to me that we can reformulate it this Mercier's formulation also in the in light of this evidence in another way strong my side bias is not only a problem when we produce arguments or not only affects producing arguments but it also can be a problem when we evaluate arguments when we produce counter arguments rebuttals and so on and so on so strong by my side bias potentially hinders or harms and threatens to make reason exchange uh, useful or successful, so we can reformulate the worry like strong mindset bias, not being sensitive and responsive in one's search for arguments to the other side, also hinders and threatens to make reason exchange pointless. Okay. And that's based on my on, 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 on this on this evidence or my assumption that we can't simply dissociate, it, separate, evaluate it from productive uses. In evaluating arguments, we usually tend also to produce some considerations for or against. So if we are supposed to be biased to some point in producing 
evidence and reasons. So this probably would affect also the evaluative, evaluative side of the problem, as some of the studies already have shown. So the conclusion to be drawn from this objection is that my side bias had better be held in check or mitigated or suppressed, suppressed if reasoning is to fulfill its supposed function and deliver its fruits, for instance, epistemic fruits. Reason and exchanges may effectively mitigate my side bias in both processing modes because they expand the search space for individual, individuals, the menu of different perspectives and arguments for or against them. But it seems to me that the main positive work is not done by my side bias, which is supposed to kind of facilitate, facilitate cognitive division of labor. It seems to me that the main positive work which is behind this debiasing effect of collective reasoning or deliberation is due to the initial diversity of views, plus some kind of interest or commitment to truth and inquiry, plus some kind of cooperative division of labor. This kind of factor seems to be important and seems to be behind the better performance or outcomes of collective reasoning. Not my side bias, too strong my side bias tends to threaten and destabilize and harm uh, actually reasoning. So the conclusion is my side bias may play at best a limited positive role in facilitating something like the natural division of argumentative labor. But the main positive work is, to be, is, to, is, is done by the diversity of views, commitment to co cooperative division of labor and so on. And my side bias is better to be held in check if collective reasoning is to be viewed or superior to individual reasoning. Uh, okay, so that's my objections to Mercier's and Sperber view. And now I would like to first present an alternative theory, social theory, a social evolutionary theory of reasoning, and also to raise some objection uh, against it. The alternative theory is, which I would like to present, and to scrutinize is that of Smith and Walt. They say, okay, private reasoning, in this they agree with Mercier and Sperber, private reasoning is not adapted to the function of increasing knowledge and improving decision-making of individual human agents. But they claim public reasoning appears to be much better adapted to that function, in part because of the efficient division of cognitive labor. So they claim basically that the function, adaptive function of reasoning is epistemic, rational one. Unlike what Mercier and Sperber propose for the argumentative function of reasoning. But they claim that this function is well served by public reasoning, not by private reasoning. So no, no surprise, they say, we greatly benefit from putting more heads together, pooling information, discussing different views and their credentials, and based on that, forming improved views conducive to success in solving problems. What hold of, uh, holds of us today likely held of ancestral people who depended on cooperation, including cognitive cooperation. We may refer, for instance, to Michael Thomas's work, who sort of develops this kind of, this kind of uh, idea in detail. So claimed evidence for this theory, uh, it does have some nice features. This theory is tailor-made to avoid some objections which I raised against Mercier and Sperber. For reasoning didn't evolve to overcome mistrust caused by the threat of deception. So it is unlikely to end up in polemical deadlocks motivation to find, because there is the motivation to find truth together. So it's unlikely that people would end up in some kind of polemical deadlocks and so on and so on. There are a couple of things which can be said in favor of this particular theory. But it, does prevent some of my objections because it's focused on rational epistemic ends and presupposes some motivation to find truth and so on together. It presupposes cooperative context. Still, I would sort of repeat or adjust my objection, my first objection, which I already raised in some form against Mercier's paper. It seems to me that it's one thing to claim that my side bias is actually advantageous or adaptive for collective reasoning. It's other claim to say that my side bias actually does impact on reasoning, but it's better to be mitigated or held in check. 
And it's other claim to think that collective reasoning might has a kind of actually the biasing pattern. So it seems to me that if people are to rip epistemic or rational benefits from collective reasoning, as this theory assumes, they better not to be too biased about their pre-existent views for the reason which I already rehearsed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Mercier's and Sperber theory. Because too biased thinking in the extreme polarized group thing is a failure. More open-minded inquiry may, may actually lead people closer to correct answers. So if individuals are at a disadvantage, at a disadvantage compared to collectives, as this theory claims, that the theory claims that there is the evidence that groups tend to reason better under some circumstances, the differences may rather consist in shared interest to find good solution, putting more heads together, so views and checks together, and dividing the cognitive labor between them. So that's my first objection, which is basically kind of similar that, to one which I raised already against Mercier's and Spamber. Uh, the claim is that uh, my side bad doesn't seem to be actually adapted to advantages. It rather seems to impact the reasoning and it better to be held in check if good collective reasoning is to deliver its fruits. Uh, but then I have a kind of different objection, which was supposed to be the main objection uh, when I started to think about the, about the paper, but right now I just have kind of, it's kind of first sketch of the objection, which I would like to develop. Maybe it's not a good one, maybe it's not powerful, but I would try it. So all, and actually this objection pertains to both kinds of theories. No matter whether you claim that the kind of adaptive function is social, as Mercier and Sperber do, or it's kind of epistemic rational as Smith and Wolf do. It seems to me that this kind of adaptionist social theories of re uh, reasoning seem to imply the following things. Adaptive trait with a certain design feature may sometimes malfunction because that feature doesn't work in some hostile context. For instance, this is the case of cognitive illusion or perceptual illusions. But typically, the adaptive trait or adaptive feature is supposed to function well in the right context. So by analogy, can't we expect, conclude that more often than not, one-sided argumentation is actually good reasoning. Yeah, I'm just following the kind of adapt adaptation as logic. Yeah, I'm supposing that the feature which helps to promote good functioning of the ability in the right context when it's exercising outcomes, it delivered good outcomes. It malfunctions only under some specific circumstances. Well, so there is this analogy. Uh, and the idea is that it doesn't it follow from this theory that one-sided argumentation should be actually good reasoning. One-sided arguments should be good arguments. If my side bias is supposed to be adaptive to promote good reasoning, good functioning of the capacity, so shouldn't its products be considered good products in some sense? Well, or perhaps not, because our normative ideals for, for well-ordered discursive exchange do not seem to treat biased, one-sided arguments as particularly good. Rather, they seem to evaluate it as bad, normatively speaking. So there is also no straightforward link between one-sided arguments and normatively good arguments. In the course of eventually normatively successful reason exchange, a lot of poor, sketchy, intuitively bad arguments may be tried out. This is conceded by Mercier and Sperber. People are supposed to be lazy reasoners at first. And then interlocutors would criticize them of that score because they are poor arguments, one-sided arguments, thereby pressing arguments to good, eventually provide better or good enough arguments, normatively speaking. So there is the dilemma if this analogy holds. The dilemma is that the first order of the dilemma is to regard bias, one-sided reasoning as mostly good reasoning significantly departs from rational norms, informal or formal. The second order is to regard such reasoning as adaptive yet mostly bad reasoning is a strange kind of adaptive functional theory. It shouldn't have this, kind of, this effect, the theory, it seems to me. So my suggestion conclusions, and I'm going to conclude, uh, ideals, norms, or virtues for well-ordered discursive exchange 
seem to reflect rational ends and tend to militate against biased, one-sided thinking. People are already sensitive to some such standards, apply and enforce them, if imperfectly. So we better have an evolutionary account of the functions of reasoning that ensures that rational norms arise as constraints that serve to coordinate reasoning dispositions, however imperfectly, in the direction of rationality. And such an account, I conclude, is unlikely to treat my set bias as a design feature of, of the function. So, thank you. This Let's go that way. Okay, uh, I was saying it's a, a nice picture and the evaluation of the mindset bias in uh, assessing the very idea of uh, arguing and uh, public reasoning in general. Um, I think there is an issue concerning the, the first objection that uh, Sperber and Mercias. Uh, provide against the intellectualist picture when they say that uh, uh, we argue in order to persuade, argue, evaluate arguments and not to update our beliefs. In a sense, they are uh, going too far intuitively because I think this is... Uh, to perform such actions in general seems to be not fully in point without having to do with belief revision somehow. So there needs to 